Welcome back, Gunters, to Get to the Good Part. I'm Ryan. I'm John. Ooh, I'm Chris. And it has been way too damn long. Two long weeks. John, first of all, how was Vegas, man? It was all right. It was a different trip <laughs> than uh, than I'm used to taking. My wife had business. and That uh, is the most unenthusiastic way to say well like, yeah i just got back from vegas <laughs> yeah i didn't get to take advantage of it like i usually do uh but i'm going back soon probably within the next uh two months shorter shorter time so it shouldn't affect the show probably a two or three day trip and then i'll get to do vegas how i normally do vegas no, it's cool, man. Go to Vegas, spend as much time as you want. Just make sure you take, you know, your computer and your microphone. And <laughs> yeah, all that like shit. I'm gonna go to Vegas just to record a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you goddamn right, you will, and you like it. And what well, happens there I, stays there, right? Yeah, but if I'm but if I'm losing, that's not uh, gonna be a very good performance. <laughs> you're in an ugly place when you're losing. I've seen you when you're losing. Oh, I'm not. It's I'm not place. a sore loser. I only take what I, I can am. afford to lose. Yes, you are. A You've sore seen loser. me lose. You've seen me I lose at a blackjack lose. table. It is embarrassing. So before we get started in earnest into the chapter, um, we posted on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, all over the place, uh, the hashtag MyOasisRide. Now we're going to bring that up sort of toward the middle of the chapter where it fits into the chapter, but we got to say, guys, thank you so much for your response. I think in total, over all social media, we got almost 60 responses from you guys, which is awesome. So thank you so much for engaging. Thank you so much for getting involved. That was pretty great. We begin Chapter 4 with Wade's eyes opening up out of the basement and into his world history classroom, led by Mr. Avenovich. Mr. Avenovich could be Mr. Avenovich, or he could be an Inuit woman. We don't know, <laughs> according to the chapter. Uh, I love how but, there's this uncertainty about the people you meet. Like, right. well, he looks like he could, sounds like he could be an old guy or something. I suspect that maybe he is, but for all I know, some chick in Alaska. Well, I think this is weird because he says, he's, he says, this could be a small Inuit woman from Alaska. Mm-hmm. But I get the feeling that this is exactly what he looks like. Why? His appearance is, is fairly realistic. Slightly older, slightly heavy set. Got a bushy beard right so what you're saying and i just want to make sure i'm getting this clear what you're saying is because mr Venovich looks like the prototypical world history teacher or any professor that that must be exactly what he looks like i don't know but yeah and i think that kind of plays to point that that you know the question here is has this individual branded themselves in the oasis to portray a part that comes across as a teacher that right. you need to listen to and that is an expert that if it was another persona you may not get as much attention but that this potentially this form has been crafted to be the perfect teacher that maybe that's an intentional thing like maybe it's kind of like you know dressing to play the part but in full with sure. gender and and skin and such this is something that we haven't covered yet but i think it's uh it's something that's kind of interesting or interested me in this part of the chapter. It's that Wade's wearing a default skin right now. It's a black t-shirt and jeans and tennis shoes or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. We don't know what the default skin is for employees in the Oasis, right? So obviously he's in the Oasis. He's employed. In, in the same way that when Wade goes to school, he's Wade 3 and he has to wear a black t-shirt and jeans. But outside of school, he's Parzival, and he can wear armor, you know, banded leather armor and a broadsword. Right. Mr. Ivanovich may very well be a gamer outside of, outside of school. He could be any age. He could even be a she. We don't know. But is this his default skin? This, this you know, professorial look, you know, with the, the, the patches on the elbows... All that kind of thing. I mean, it's 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 very much a stereotypical professor that he's describing. Yeah. For some reason, Wade thinks this is the way the guy looks, but maybe that's the way that Wade just pictures professors to look. Um, hard to tell. 
But but is there a different default skin? Like say you say you work at a mall on the Oasis, right? My sister used to work for a certain retail company that, you know, smells like shit when you walk past it. <laughs> like cologne and stuff. I think we talked about this before, didn't we? Like fashionable young boys? Yes. Go yeah, on. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> She used to work for one of those types of companies, if not that exact company, okay? And they have standards for the way that people look when they come into work. They have standards for the way that they want them to dress. They have to wear a certain type of outfit. It's not outside of the realm of possibility to consider that in the Oasis, if you're a teacher, there's a certain way that they want you to look. Is that a criteria along with being qualified as a teacher you know what i mean is that are those rules set by the school it's almost a like a dress code. yeah it's almost a dress code it's almost yeah it's almost a uniform that right you know world history class is is this uniform you know okay. could that be could that mr avenovich had been have been somebody else 10 years ago be right. somebody else in 10 years from now could it is it just mr avenovich's class and whoever fills that role could be anybody. Here's here's what I honestly think. And this is going to be a slightly grating response to this whole this whole topic, but it's true. I think this was this was Ernest Klein painting a picture for you, right? Because at no other point and he mentions other classes, at no other point does he describe a teacher. Mm-hmm. But he describes this teacher. And I don't know that it was because Mr. Ivanovich is is in any way special to Wade. I mean, he mentions that he likes him, but he doesn't mention that he's he's particularly inspirational to Wade or anything like that. He just mentions that he likes him. Um, I think that that's kind of a tell for Ernest Klein as far as as the storytelling goes. I think he's trying to paint a picture where you can you can imagine yourself in this. Uh, you know, like he said in previous chapters. The schools and the oasis can be whatever the hell you want them to be because it's just code, mm-hmm. right? So they're, you know, marble floors, you know, very ornate libraries, that kind of thing. Um, you know, Mr. Ivanovich fits very well by description into that setting, right? He's, he's very, you know, he's your prototype professor, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, so... That's I, I guess that's that's kind of my point with this is that Mr. A, Mr. Avenovich, comes in at the beginning of the chapter and he is your picture of what a teacher would be um, in the Oasis, your ideal professor. But he doesn't really go into describing other teachers. So we don't know if it's a default skin. We don't really have any basis for comparison. Yeah. It's just Wade, Wade says that he feels like that's how he looks outside the oasis and so i guess that's that's really the only thing but, we get but why balance it why say it, it could be an inuit woman you seem pretty convinced it's fucking not so why are you bringing yeah, it up that's true <laughs> well i think it's the point here that that I, this leads on to a couple of things because and, and i i'm dancing around some future points here but what he's really painting is that while anyone can be anything in the Oasis, some people choose to be themselves. And their personality and their voice and their mannerisms seem to match up with the persona that's being portrayed in the Oasis. And that there is a difference between those that are more artificial or very different in the Oasis versus those who portray themselves more realistically in the Oasis. I think what he's really saying is, I really like him, and I consider him to be kind of like me, and I'm more honest about my character being reflective of who I am, and I think maybe that person is reflective of who they are. Exactly. Like there are some people in the Oasis where you'll see that they're very dramatically different, yet here's a person who's very realistic. There's there's something to be said about branding, and professionals will do this too, and what they'll do is they will figure out what to wear in order to make them feel a certain way and to come across a certain way to certain people. Like when you go in for an interview, you might wear a suit. Or depending on how you dress at work might determine really over time how people interact with you. Uh, 
so when you talk about a, a person who's in the Oasis that can completely control how they come across, I, you know, I think he's make, making that comment that this could be some Inuit woman. And this is the this is the the avatar that this person needs to choose in order to be hired to fulfill the role that they're fulfilling. One of the things that we find out very early in the book is that Wade has has built his persona or his avatar around the sort of idyllic perception of himself, right? Right. It's not it's not something completely spaced out and weird. It's him. But it's him improved. Mm-hmm. Now, you you can't really you can't really define what an improvement is, <laughs> but you know, Wade is his own version of an improvement on himself, right? Wade is Wade is in the oasis whom Wade would want to be in reality. In right. that reality, yeah. But the interesting thing about this chapter and the, the interesting thing about Mr. Ivanovich here is that now we have two, two specific examples at this point. We're, we're only on chapter four. We're on page 47 of the book. So we're still at the very beginning of this book. But twice now, uh, with Artemis and now with Mr. Ivanovich, he suspends all disbelief that these two people, you know, look any different in real life. I won't say all disbelief, I guess, because he said at one point when he was talking about Artemis that she she might be some hairy old bastard named Chuck living in his mom basement <laughs> or something like that. But but still, he got the feeling that she looked exactly like, you know, like she said she did. He says the same thing for Mr. Ivanovich. I don't know if that's like a projection from Wade because he's designed his avatar based on who he actually is or what he actually looks like. Um, then the people that he actually draws a, a certain affinity for kind of thinks that they look the same. Did he say the same thing about H? I don't recall. Well, no, he asked H, you know, do you look like this in real life? And that's H right. said, yeah, yeah, but in real life, I look even more handsome. So it's yeah. not so much that that he feels that age looks that way. It's that we've addressed that they've asked that question. So all of the people that he knows within the Oasis so far, he's projected this kind of thing on, except for the one that we've cleared up. Because mm-hmm. the only ones we've really talked about that he's wondered what they look like in real life is Artemis and Mr. Ivanovich. And he automatically figures that they look exactly like they do in real life. That's just the inter- I, I found it interesting. It is interesting. Well, I think it's, you know, he sees these genuine-looking avatars and feels like they may be somewhat honest portrayals of the real person outside of the Oasis, because that's exactly what he did. And it's also because he, he views them as people he trusts right. a little bit. I mean, he talks about his, his affinity for Mr. Ivanovich. He talks about how he likes him. He doesn't really talk about that uh, as far as other teachers go. But Mr. Ivanovich is the one he kicks off with. It's the one, you know, obviously it's the first class he loads into. But I'm pretty sure it's the only one he mentions by name. And, right. you know, mm-hmm. and Artemis is the other one that he, he goes into. But both of them, he just like, w- when he shows a little bit of trust within the Oasis, his response is, I'm sure, you know, I get the feeling that they look a lot like, you know, what they've put out there. Right. It's just, it's interesting. And I, it could split two ways for me. One is that Wade is a little bit gullible and a little bit trusting, okay? Because we don't know at this point in the book where either of these people are going to go. Mm-hmm. Or two, that you you develop a certain sort of instinct within a virtual reality simulation, okay? Where when you see certain people um, or, or, you know, you you come across certain avatars more appropriately, uh, you can see them and you can say, you know what, that looks genuine. Or that looks like that's, that's, that's who you really are. 
that's not a far cry from what we do on a daily basis when we pass people on the street. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like when you, I mean, you can call it judgmental or you could be more realistic and you could call it just human condition. When you pass certain people on the street, you form judgment, just it comes out. You know what I mean? This is sort of an evolved version of that to fit in with a simulation. I don't know. I'm probably no, 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 no. It's, I mean, it's just like it's just like getting dressed up and all make up up before right. you leave the house. You want to look your best, and this is a way for them to look their best in yeah, a way. Exactly. It, it, it's also a way for you. To, you take a look at these people, and you're like, you know, that's genuine. That's not. Mm -hmm. That's well, a judgment call. It, it's a means of manipulating people's perception around you. It's it's what you wear and how how you how you present yourself is going to determine how other people respond to you, and depending on how you how secure you are about whom you are, is going to kind of determine to a certain extent whether or not you need to do all of that stuff. And I think the makeup thing is a really great concept because I think there are, there are women out there that are absolutely beautiful and don't do not need makeup. They're very comfortable living in their own skin without anything on it. And then I think that's I'm not placing a judgment on everyone that uses makeup, but I, there are some that lean very heavily on it. Mm -hmm. And it just it feels like it's it's compensating to a point where it's almost like going into the oasis and creating a skin that overcompensates for what you otherwise wouldn't like about yourself. Right. Or that you're presenting yourself very differently. Like if you've ever seen those videos where you get like some 16 year old that all of a sudden does the makeup and they look 32. Mm hmm. And it's just, it's scary, like really, you know, just scary how adult looking this child looks, mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not from an attraction perspective, but from a holy shit, they could basically spoof their way into a bar and fool people that way. Uh, you know, I see this as being similar, like how you want to manipulate the world around you in part depends on how you brand yourself right from when you get up in the morning and start you know, fixing your hair and such and the clothes you wear. Yeah. At any rate, uh, no matter what Mr. Ivanovich or the Inuit woman look like <laughs> in the Oasis, they definitely have the best job in this universe. Don't know how much they get paid, but it's a hell of a lot better than teaching in the real world. Uh, that's one thing that he kind of outlines here. And why? First of all, you don't really have to wrangle in the kids. You know what I mean? They're, you've got a captive audience within the Oasis. Uh, Wade doesn't really acknowledge it here, but I think it's important to, to mention that you have to have a certain grade point average to get into an Oasis public school. So already you're dealing with, you know, you've, you've filtered out disruptive students, right? So that immediately makes a teacher's job just a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. okay? Well... And here's another thing is that you can't really be disruptive in the Oasis. Right. You know, it doesn't let you. I mean, yeah. think of how many kids with <laughs> low GPAs might have actually done fucking better in the Oasis. Right. With less distraction, with less ability to distract others. And then you think about, like, the way that, that they teach is, you know, they're taking you to different planets or different periods of time. We kind of touched on this in previous talks. I, but it's just way more interactive, and as a result, I think more memorable, and it communicates better than just, oh, like, yeah. again, scratching on a chalkboard or reading in a book. Which is the second part of what makes this job amazing. <laughs> I mean, any teacher in the world, and again, I, I go back to the book and locker reference from the, you know a few episodes ago, but why do you even need a book at this point? You know uh, what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if, if I mean, if if you want to talk about you know the day of Kennedy's assassination, I know it's a little bit dark, but I mean, you could take the kids to the fucking grassy knoll if you wanted to. <laughs> you could have them sitting back with Kennedy and his right. wife <laughs> waving. Well, you probably <laughs> wouldn't stick them there, Chris. That would be fucking dark and weird and awful. <laughs> well, they could help Jackie O gather up the skull and the brains. Oh, and bits Jesus from the Christ, trunk. John! Somehow it's still too soon. <laughs> Somehow it's still too soon. Really? <laughs> it feels weird. I feel weird. I mean, that that footage yeah. of her <laughs> reaching back has been out forever. I know. 
It does. I'm surprised <laughs> Lil because you know what she's doing. And now we're talking about putting kids in the back seat. Thanks, Ryan. That's. <laughs> I don't know why I do this. I don't know why I come back. But I get it. I mean, you can, you can. I mean, how visceral is that? Like, you don't, you don't understand the reality and the impact of a moment. Unless you're there, like there's stuff that can be told and there's stuff that can be experienced that can't be told. And through this kind of interactive concept, you can actually experience something that goes way beyond the kind of learning that you're just talking about stuff. Right. Like We can say he got shot, but if if you saw him, you know, a quick run through of him on television and how people responded to him and the newspapers of the time. And then you quickly jump back to the grassy knoll where you see him driving through and you hear the gunshot and the top of his head pop off. And it's just, you know, you get to experience the, the same shock and awe that leads up to all the crazy conspiracy theories and the additional stuff that came afterwards. And, you mm -hmm. know, to anybody 40 or 50 years later, it might seem kind of weird but during that period of time, it, it definitely fit in because it was just so extreme in the moment. Mm -hmm. And we're not just talking about world history here. Beyond that, um, you know, think about the applications in other classrooms. Wade brings up that the art, the art history class or the art class can go and tour the Louvre. Um, and then in science, they can go out and they can see the solar system. They can see the different moons of Jupiter. That, to me, is Fucking incredible. Yeah. That would be so awesome. Because we've all been to the planetarium. I mean, it's great when you're a kid, but it's not that impressive. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, imagine, like like right now, uh, I, I, saw, I saw a news article pretty recently, I, I think within the past few days, that now they think that they have actually captured a picture of a black hole. I'm curious to see what the picture turns out to be because I've I've also read the articles. I've heard that they're they've they're putting the picture together. There's a lot of data that they have to kind of square together, and then they have to sort of artificially tone it up Render so that the, you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that it turns it into something that we can perceive a little bit better. For example, they'll say, "Okay, the X-rays we're going to make red, and we're going to have variations of hues on right. that, and you know, gamma is going to be green, and you get these really beautiful colory pictures of the universe." But that's not a real picture. Right. Those aren't real renditions. That isn't like like Super HD. That's, you know, a lot of sensors looking at a lot of wavelengths we can't see. And then they're being colorized in order to reflect what that would look like if we could see it in a spectrum that we could identify. Mm -hmm. You know, basically reducing it down to our narrow band. So I think however they're perceiving the black hole, they're going to do it that way. They're, they're basically going to colorize the stuff that we otherwise couldn't see with our eyes. So, Wade moves through his school day, going through the solar system, checking out the Louvre and all kinds of shit that you probably wish that you could do while you're at school or anywhere. I mean, people would pay, people do pay so much money to do the shit he's doing in the Oasis to go on vacation. Could it's you just, imagine it's if we could take like to a, me. a fraction of our military spending? And replicate just the education system and throw all of that shit into VR and into businesses and backing businesses that are willing to advance VR in that way. Just a fraction. We'd still be like a top military because, you know, we spend like gargantuous amounts of money more than like the top three next countries. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Just a fraction and turn it into education. Imagine if we could just remove all of the buildings, just education system as a whole. And, and remote in teachers that are qualified and have them centrally teach, that system would be so compact and so refined and so interactive. Our, I think our education system would just, you know, blow past any other country. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's it's mind-boggling. This this is the, the part of this that's kind of like, holy crap, we should do that now <laughs> because we can. It's freaking nuts that that uh, what we spend our money on and the fact that we're like, we have the technology to do this now. This is the best way to do it. I mean, all of our kids would be freaking brilliant if you could stick them in these environments and really communicate and educate in this way. You're not in an audience right now that's going to disagree with you. On that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we both we both wholeheartedly agree with you on that. But outside of this fantastical universe 
that is created by the Oasis public school system. Wade finds himself eating lunch in the back of his hideout. It's a protein bar. Doesn't sound very delicious. And sort of envying the kids around him. This is kind of the back to reality moment. When, when I read this part, it really kind of sunk into me. The division between reality and the simulation. You know what I mean? Like lunchtime has got to be the moment when that hits. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, most kids like like where, you know, when you take off your headset and you're going to go eat lunch, where are you going to go? Are you going to go to your kitchen, grab something out of the fridge? Are you going to, you know, drive down the street, grab yourself a burger from McDonald's? Or are you going to lift up your visor, grab into a fucking Star Wars lunchbox, pull out a protein bar, and that's your lunch? It's just, to me, this is the part where those moments where he has to cut back into reality. They really bum me out for some reason. <laughs> I'd, I'd imagine having to go to the bathroom is the same problem. Oh, yeah. Like, you're in the Oasis. It's like, oh, hold on a second. I, I gotta use the restroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, but, but but I mean, like, when you talk about something like, like going to eat, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. he's, you know, there are all these kids. They've got all kinds of options. And they, you know, I mean, they're, like I said, you know, you go to your kitchen, you're going out to eat, you're going to a, you know, a fast food restaurant or whatever. He is literally, like, eating something to fucking sustain himself. It's like, this is the most affordable thing that I can find to fill my gullet and not die. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just bums is me it, out. Is it... He's a high school student, for Christ's sake. It's not like he's doing this to stay fit. Is it possible for for other students to like just check out completely for lunch, go off and do their thing? Like they can take the visor off and everything, go off, grab lunch, and then come back, check back in, and well, and yes, but he he could do that. He as says well. he chooses. Yes, yeah, he chooses to stay. He says he chooses to keep his visor right. On. So right. He definitely does not like the state of his life. He will not life. leave that simulation right. unless he has right. to. <laughs> if I'm eating lunch, I wouldn't want to like pull the visor off and go, I'm going to look at the back of my van. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so much cooler shit to tell. I mean, let's, it's, it's not like you're you're eating stroganoff where you have to take it off in order to make sure the noodles don't fall on you. It's a protein bar. You know, you can yeah. pretty much you can pretty much peel that banana and eat it blind. Yeah. But while Wade is having lunch, he mentions the fact that he doesn't have the credits to get off world. Something we'll expand upon here in a minute. But he also notices or makes mention of the fact that the other students are basically showing up to school and leaving school in an armada of fantasy ships. I mean, shit that you would dream about when you were a kid. <laughs> See, I can relate to this because I went to a Catholic high school when I lived in Seattle, but I was not. My my family was not particularly wealthy, so <laughs> the kids leaving. So you had a hoopty. I had a hoopty. <laughs> I had a hoopty. I had a nineteen seventy nine Caprice Classic two tone paint job. Jesus Christ! The first yes. ten years of it were in Florida, so the one tone was basically a rustic blue, which translates to it was rusted, mm -hmm. and then the sides were like nearly the original color. It was it was super hoopty. Yeah, I had a hoopty, but that it was like my hoopty parked next to Mercedes and Mercedes <laughs> and Volkswagen, uh, just you know any number of other cars that looked. Mine, mine was the crappiest car in the parking lot. Well, down. all of those kids would have been severely depressed <laughs> being in the Oasis, even if you're driving a Mercedes or a BMW. You're pulling up next to fucking Tie Fighters. Give me a break. So, we reached out to you, our listeners, for this part of the chapter. Uh, we created the hashtag MyOasisRide and asked you guys what your ride would be in the Oasis if the Oasis were a reality or a thing that existed. And, my God, the response was huge. 
Thank you so much to everybody who actually wrote in on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, it was so much fun reading through them. Uh, but we're just going to read through a few of them right now. And I'm going to try to kind of speed through them so that we can get through as many as possible. So the first one, uh, this is the top voted one on Reddit uh, from the user I Fart Confetti. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, real. that harkens back to the day we were talking about uh, <laughs> usernames online, gamer tags. Right, right, right. I fart confetti. Good for you, man. <laughs> but thanks for writing in. Um, he says a gun star with the heavier armor <sighs> plating and the death blossom prototype weapon. I'd be ready to fuck up the code in armada. <laughs> the problem with the death death blossom. The, <laughs> <laughs> the problem with the death blossom <laughs> is that you'd get sick. I'm pretty sure. I, I, I'm not. Do you spin around inside of it, or did it keep you in one place and the ship spun around you? No, I'm pretty sure you spun with the damn. Th you'd you'd basically go hork, and then like your windshield would be just <laughs> puked. And the dude behind you is like his head snaps off because the thing's spinning too fast. All right, <laughs> let's move on. The second one comes from uh, Lord Lupton. From Reddit, and he says, he or she says, have to be the heart of gold with the improbability drive. That's a good one. That's a good reference. Yeah. Do you yeah. guys know? Do, do you know what the heart of gold is from? Uh, it's, it's the one with the towel. Guide to Hitchhiker's the Guide to the uh, Yes. Okay. Right. Right. That's the yeah. ship that they flew in. Yeah. Which is a good reference. And it, the the robot was uh, voiced by Alan Rickman. Yeah, and yeah, he that sounded, was the worst except, voicing. Oh, are you ever. kidding me? I thought it was great. He was sounded depressed the so entire emo. movie. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. So, for anybody R. who's R. listening, Alan the book Rickman. the book is a, the, the book by Douglas Adams is definitely worth reading, or having and, it read to you. <laughs> yeah, or having it read to you. If you for those prefer that, prefer that audio books. Yeah. All right. So the next one comes from Captain Eight Track. Captain Eight Track says he would have the uh, the TARDIS. That's Doctor good. Eight. I mean, at least you know parking would be easy. Fucking perfect. It's so great because it's a very comp. I respond. I actually responded to this guy and I said, "That is pretty badass." Although I'd go for the TARDIS on the inside, but the phone booth from Bill and Ted on the outside. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. <laughs> None of that police phone booth stuff. Right. Bill and Ted phone booth. That would be Fucking awesome. Fucking gum holding up the antenna. George Carlin welcoming me inside. Yeah, yeah. That'd be pretty Yeah, good. I'm into that. If, that if the TARDIS awesome. and Bill and Ted could be could be somehow <laughs> bastardized and, <laughs> and brought together. That that's, is my That's thing. beautiful. Yeah. All right, so we've got a lot of... Uh, Doc Brown's uh, steam engine that came from. Uh, that's a good one. PFK Nun. Yeah, that's 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 a little weighty. I Sorry, don't know. PFK. compared to what, like a Tie Fighter? Oh, it's bigger. Bigger than a Tie Fighter. <laughs> really? <laughs> this yeah. one bigger than I, a Tie Fighter. I like this one a lot. I don't know why, but I feel like this has to be somebody's dad. This guy's name is Flem. The Man Dragon. <laughs> Flem the Man Dragon says, a 1956 Ford Thunderbird, and then <laughs> follows it up with, "What? It's a cool car. I guess it could have some sort of fuzzy dice or something." It's like he read my mind. <laughs> Way to go, Flem. It's like I'm sitting That's a good here. One. And his no, I, I included that perfect. in the picture that I put together. <laughs> and and I was like, yeah, that's that's pretty badass. Because my my first thought was, and yeah, 19... what's coming next? <laughs> that can fly? <laughs> no, no. This one hits me right in the heartstrings. Uh, Transmogrify from Reddit said, uh, "The car that the astronaut drives in the opening shot of Heavy Metal." I never saw that movie. I didn't either. And now I feel a little bit bad that I chose you guys to do this fucking <laughs> podcast. You've never seen heavy metal. No. I, I know I know of heavy I, metal. Dude, and I've had many I was a Yo MTV raps guy. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's 
The only reason I watched heavy metal when I was younger is because Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis were in heavy metal. <laughs> oh, were they? <laughs> Which is the saddest reason. Well, I Dave, think they just did like a bit part, but Dave Thomas, the Wendy's guy? No, no, not, not the fucking the Wendy's, Wendy's guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> just, that's the Dude, only Dave Thomas you, I like, know. Did you ever watch SCTV? Uh, a little bit. You were close to it, weren't you? In Seattle. <laughs> you were closer than we yeah. were. It a little. Should have been, should have been on TV a lot more closer. than it was here. Space Toast 42 said, The Arcadia from Space Pirate Captain Harlock. If I needed something smaller, I would go with the Interceptor from Mad Max. Good call. Okay. Nice. Classic. Snatch Pastry from Red. Wow. These are, these are great. I think the names are, critical, are more really. enjoyable than their, their ship ideas. I think it's both. But Snatch Pastry says, the Cyclone Motorcycle slash Body Armor from Robotech, the one with the arm sabers, of course, or even better, an Alpha Fighter with a stowed Cyclone. You went full nerd there. Yeah. You went full nerd there, Snatch Pastry. I respect it. <laughs> Yeah, you you really dipped into a reference that would well beyond my repertoire. But it sounds awesome. Windog says the spinner car from Blade Runner. Awesome. Cool. 0314 says uh, one of the old retro scooters. I'm a simple man. Um, Blades Edge 7 says Imperial Star Destroyer all the way. <laughs> The whole, I mean, that's your hoopty right there. That's your right. space yeah, hoopty. Yeah. That's a large ship. Yeah. That's your, yeah. It's shaped like a fucking arrowhead. <laughs> I cannot not see an arrowhead when I see a Star Destroyer. That's true. Um, all right. SP Dorsey says Magnum PI Ferrari with flux capacitor time travel drive. Okay. Good nice. one. Nice. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I like the, <laughs> I like that. Like, that's a good This combo. guy. SP Dorsey, I'm going to credit you for weaving universes together. <laughs> because for the rest of the thread, you kind of see that happening. So, you know, big ups to you, guy. Uh, Tommy Dudd gave us a, a more detailed description. He said, it would have to be a DeLorean with a flux capacitor and all that jazz or the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> I've seen Back to the Future so many times and it really captures the 80s. Which would give me some serious Gunter Street cred. <laughs> did I mention that the Millennium Falcon did the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs? <laughs> so uh, CB2001 said uh, for the car, and at this point they start segmenting out like their 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 spaceships versus their like land speeder kind of things, or or the things that fly in space and the things that fly on a planet. Which is really okay. cool. This kind of happened organically. Um, but CB2001 says for the car, for the planet, he would have a Dodge M4S Turbo Interceptor, as seen in the 1986 film The Wraith, uh, with all unique properties, single-person spacecraft, uh, the rapier, um, from the movie version of Wing Commander, uh, and the multi-person spacecraft of the spaceship that could be you know, do interstellar travel uh, would be the Sulaco from Aliens or the Moya from Farscape, uh, complete with pilot. Wait, so did it have the ship with the pilot? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Okay. <laughs> Nothing. I was just, I was just thinking. You know, it, for me, it'd be kind of like I want to be able to pilot my own. I'm thinking like alone, right? Like, what would I consider to be like my bachelor pad slash starship? And he's thinking, well, you know, I want a, I want a, a limousine complete with the guy driving it, which not a bad option. Little, you know, a little AI driver, pilot of his yeah. own. All right. So these next four, these next four come from, uh, just so you guys know, these come from my four favorite people in our community so far because they've been so lovely, they've been so active, and they've been so just they've engaged with us so much. And uh, the next four people, can't thank you enough. You guys have been awesome. Uh, the first one up is 
uh, username M477M4R60L15. There's a shorter way to say that, <laughs> but I don't want to say it because I don't know if you'd be comfortable with it. But anyways, guy, you know who you are. Thank you so much. Uh, and he had a very simple one at first. He said, uh, for space travel, the USS Enterprise D. The thing is, it's hard to beat that one because it's kind of just like the the Enterprise was built for fucking space travel. And it was like, you know, here's the most comfortable situation you could possibly imagine for interstellar travel. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to it, it's hard to disagree with that one. Uh, the next one uh, in, in our all stars panel here comes from um, I.D. Geely, I.D. G.E.L.E.E. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, but they said, uh, small attack would be Slave 1. Fuck yeah. That's a Boba Fett's ship, mm-hmm. for anybody who doesn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, large star travel would be Bebop, from Cowboy Bebop. Or maybe one of the Enterprises. Do you think the holodecks would work in the Oasis, or would that be too meta? Great question. <laughs> we, can't, we can't really go into that. We won't get too far into that. ID Julie, whatever the fuck you want, it's possible. It's the Oasis. Go for it. Um, and then edited to add, uh, would parking a Star Wars craft on the deck of a Star Trek ship be considered blasphemy? <laughs> My answer would be absolutely not. Not in the Oasis. You're allowed to do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> you get a lot of dirty looks, though. Maybe. You Cats probably and dogs would. living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> Mass hysteria. <laughs> Star Wars, Star Trek, <laughs> parking on each other, entering each other's cargo bays. Who's going to care? Well, who directed right. the new Star Trek movie? Was it Joss Whedon or J.J. J. Abrams? J. Was it, it was J.J. J. Abrams, and he snuck in R2-D2. <gasps> oh, wait a second. Was it out in space? Like it was debris? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. Um, so. Or at least I saw the video that... that slowed it down enough to see Yeah, I it. think it was very... It's hard to say if that was doctored or... or I, uh, I, I don't think know, he did but... it on purpose. I think it was an intentional move. Kind of a fuck you to the Star Trek universe. Yeah. Thing. Sorry, guys. Alright, so let's move on. The next one is from, uh, again, one of my favorite people in the Reddit community. Uh, this guy has been great to us. Um, A. Margulies. Uh, said a spacecraft for every day getting around would be the Serenity. Love the show, love the ship. And the Eagle 5, Winnebago. Spaceballs, man. <gasps> okay, yeah. All right, I get it. I get yeah. it. Golf Machine, who has been awesome giving us feedback and just staying in touch, um, said the Phoenix from Battle of the Planets, which is a good one. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about our own, okay? Mm-hmm. And now I, I want to tell you guys out there listening that somehow it's it's been a feat of strength, but for two weeks we've been talking about this chapter, and for two weeks we have kept from one another what our choices would be for our Oasis rides. So any laughter or ribbing you hear from here on out will be absolutely genuine. <laughs> So, Chris, you seemed the least enthusiastic about yours. <laughs> what would yours be? It, my my first choice was um, was was the Firefly ship, mm-hmm. the Serenity. I loved it. Like I, I love the idea that you know it's this it's it's one of those where it's kind of like your castle, but it's not a gargantuous castle. You know, it's got your kitchen, it's got your five bedrooms, it's got the place for you to go and steer the thing, and it's got your fairly decent engine compartment. You know, it's. It, you know, it's just super cool, uh, mm-hmm. in a very basic and and gritty sort of way. And I just loved every aspect of that. You know, you had the the shuttle if you wanted to have your sort of you know your your love space whatnot, because that was already kind of decked out in in loveliness. Uh, just really cool. Like it could do everything, and it still had that 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 uh, it, it had the hoopty feel. Let's say the, the Serenity is the space hoopty. That that's exactly what that is. Mm-hmm. 
I actually I actually changed it up now that I'd, I'd looked around a bit. Uh, I decided to go with uh, the Phoenix Hawk out of the BattleTech universe. Okay. And if you're familiar with BattleTech at all, it's uh it's just that sort of robot warring is the gist there. It's just that that futuristic military robots, but this particular one had this ability to sort of transform into a jet. It had this sort of midway transformation where it was par partial jet, partial robot, still able to kind of pop out the guns and fire. So if anybody's you know familiar with the BattleTech stuff, uh, that was a a fun was that was a fun mech to pilot. John, what's yours? Mine would probably be, as of right now, uh, did you ever see Flight of the Navigator? Fuck yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That ship was pretty cool on the inside. Outside, it kind of looked like a walnut, but <laughs> it does change shape a little bit. And it would always... And it's it like that liquid always, metal. Yeah, it would always look clean. The one thing I would not have to do is clean my ship. Well, you wouldn't have to do that anyways because it's a video game. <laughs> you don't. It doesn't get dirty. I wouldn't think so. Okay. It did. It did have that liquid metal thing going on. Like, depending on if you were just flying through the atmosphere or going through space. Right. Yeah. And then, and the the pilot's chair would come up from the floor. Uh, and Paul Rubens, mm -hmm. uh, was the mm -hmm. was the voice of the ship. Now that might get annoying after a while, but he did. His voice did change throughout. <laughs> <laughs> throughout the movie so uh i'm sure we could that's what alter ruined that. that movie for me as a kid really i just, i just grew oh, up a yeah, huge like Pee Wee herman fan so that doesn't that doesn't i annoy was too me. i i was not so when it went from like serious to reading his mind going ha, ha, i can't believe it how about you it's like oh my god I, we just took this to a level of stupid that was like a, a left turn for me in the movie it was one of those moments where i was like eating the popcorn and i brought the popcorn in my mouth and I was like ah, fuck it and threw the popcorn back in the bag <laughs> it just it just you know it was so it was serious and just kind of edgy and then you know the spaceship comes and just, you get inside and then he's like no, I need to read your mind now oh my god ah! you know I'm like oh <laughs> poor aliens all right so my choice and I've kept this a very closely guarded secret from the guys and from you out there listening my choice for for my car or whatever it would be, my ride, um, and I only chose one for the uh, you know the planetary travel. My choice would be Falcor from the Neverending Story. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. <laughs> uh, tell me, tell me what it's not, John. It's not a ship. It doesn't matter if it's a ship or not. It's still a mode of transportation. It is a mode of transportation. Not only is it a mode of transportation, it's a fucking awesome mode of transportation. That's true. It's a giant long dog that can take you wherever you want to go and yeah. keep you safe. You and can tell you stories. Can you travel through space? Yes, you can. Okay. Well, wait a second. Do we know this as a matter of fact? Uh, I know this as a matter of fact because it's a fucking video game, and he can do whatever he wants to in a video <laughs> game. None of this is real. This is a simulation. We've covered that. <laughs> <laughs> Falcor could Falcor could have Amanda Pete's face if I wanted it to. That'd be that'd be interesting. <laughs> John's like, yeah, I'd be into that. <laughs> yeah. So, no matter what your ride is, you're going somewhere after school. Most kids are going to nightclubs, rock concerts, or gaming arenas. Wade is doing none of that. He's hanging out on Ludus because he doesn't have the scratch to make it off of, of Ludus. Um, we kind of go into an explanation of how GSS has made the Oasis profitable. It's not from subscription fees or anything like that. It's because they charge transportation fees within the Oasis. Now, the Oasis is a huge place, okay? Huge. It's the biggest Oasis you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> you think you got a big Oasis. You ought to see my Oasis. It's fucking huge. I described it to a Rubik's Cube, and that every, every block in the Rubik's Cube right. was like 10 light years across. Light hours. So it's because it, it, traveling light Did speed. Did I say years? 
I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, light light it hours. It takes ten hours. Yeah. Right. Traveling light speed. Right. It takes ten hours to get across any one of these uh, little solar system kind of things within the Oasis universe. Um, and out of these out of these different galaxies, if you want to call them, or solar systems, or whatever, um, they're all made up of sort of a cornucopia of planets, just anything you could possibly imagine. Uh, to give you an example, uh, what Ernest Klein provides for us is Middle Earth, Vulcan, Pern, Araxis, Magrathea, Discworld, Midworld, Riverworld, Ringworld, Worlds Upon Worlds. Uh, another thing that he mentions here is that World of Warcraft and other uh, MMOs and things like that, just, just other video games are ported into the Oasis. So any game that you want to play is accessible through the Oasis, which makes the Oasis more of like a, a universal console, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're into MMOs and things like that. This mm -hmm. isn't too far-fetched, right? <laughs> you can imagine this happening, that there's going to be one console to rule them all eventually. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously it'll probably be the Master Race, the PCs. Um, yeah. I'm a console guy myself, but I still acknowledge the fact that PC is the master race. It'll happen one of these days. Or maybe a, a normalized network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think I think one of the problems is you've got maybe a company is using a group of servers or a cloud system somewhere. They have their own software, their own means of communicating back and forth. Uh, and the software has to be written differently than, say, like on a different, a different operating system and a different platform. And to actually get everything to talk... And operate at the same speed, man. That that can I would imagine that can be challenging. And I don't know if enough about the technicalities of it, but I, I can see where that would be kind of goofy to do, unless you know if you could imagine PlayStation and Xbox merging. We also mention here, we find out what the Oasis stands for. It's the ontologically anthropocentric sensory immersive simulation. Nicely done, the Oasis. We had to look up what ontologically meant. Um, ontological ontology ontologically so yeah ontology but we had to look it up um, and I'm glad we did I'm really glad we did ontological relating to the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being the nature of being I wonder if he was just like I know this is the oasis I gotta find some words <laughs> to fill in for these letters so oh uh, ontological I mean it's it's an interesting it's it's an interesting you know first word to use for a simulation like mm -hmm. the oasis um that you have this sort of you know the essence of being anthropomorphized you know which obviously means you know made human like or made lifelike so the essence of your being made lifelike and it's, you know, again, one of those things that's kind of slipped in there that I think is very eloquent in its execution as far as how the rest of the story plays out and how we perceive the characters at this point in the book. Um, you know, it's not a struggle between what's reality and what's not. It's more of a struggle between, you know, how these people identify themselves in the real world versus the simulated reality. I think it's hard to, for them to draw that distinction sometimes. And you'll see that more as the book goes along, but, I mean, you can you can see it in this chapter, and you've probably already seen it. And we're not even in Chapter 5 yet, but it's something that's been, you know, something of a recurring theme. Right. So, GSS makes most of its money from travel within the Oasis. Fuel costs money if you own your own ship, but what costs the most money and where GSS makes most of its money is through teleportation fees, because obviously it's going to take a long time to get across the Oasis. Essentially, if you're a video gamer, uh, what we're talking about here is you can pay, you know, 50 cents to drive across the map, or you could pay 75 cents to fast travel there. Now, 
I play a lot of video games. I'd pay the extra quarter. Would you not? <laughs> if it was just a quarter? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know. But think about but, it. I mean, you're cutting time. Multiply, multiply that quarter by all the people in the fucking world, man. Because that's what we're talking about with the Oasis. Well, yeah, but we don't know, we don't know exactly how much it is. Every time you fast travel. But uh, he, he fast traveled across the planet, and that was hundreds of credits. Yeah, but you don't know what a credit's worth in 2045. No, that's, that's true, but when you're poor, it costs a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think you can't afford right. it. It's a lot of money. I think I'm the type of I'm the type of person that in games like that, any any type of campaign that might take a normal gamer maybe three, four, five hours to to complete probably takes me twice as long. Just because I like to I, I like to look at every inch in that game just to make sure I'm not forgetting or missing anything. Yeah. So, however you decide to travel. Um, Obviously, teleportation is the ideal way because you never know where you're going to land if you're traveling, you know, the 10 light hours across one of these little systems. Um, you could end up in a place that uh, that is a technology-free zone. You could end up in a place where it's, you know, very aggressive PvP. You never know. All of these worlds have different rules, which is really interesting, too. Um, it's not unlike what you would imagine space travel to be uh, in reality. It's unlike it in that, you know, I mean, it's not like you're going to land on a planet. It's going to be like, well, I can't kill you because this is not a PvP zone. <laughs> We're on Mars. Nobody can kill anybody. It doesn't work that way. But it's it's more like, you know, technology works here. It doesn't here. You know, in the same way you can breathe air here, but you can't breathe air here. You know what I mean? It's just got different sort of rules on right. every planet or every system you get into. Um, you know, I thought it was really interesting that, that some of them were, you know, technology planets and others. Like if you were going to sort of like, you know, a medieval or, or you know, a medieval fantasy kind of planet or even something that was a little more prehistoric, you could go in there with your spaceship and guess what? Your spaceship doesn't fucking work anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Simply because you traveled into a place where that doesn't exist yet. So it's possible to get stranded on a planet. Yeah. No, it's possible to get stranded as soon as you enter right. that area. Like, not just a planet, but like, you shuffle into a new zone, and it's a no magic, no tech zone, and you just... Womp, 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 womp. So what, I mean, are you, you're <laughs> stranded there? Let's say you're out of credits. You're Luke on Dagobah, man. You're stranded You're waiting there. for fucking Yoda to come out and raise your ship out of the swamp. Now what Now what happens when you've got class the next day? Yeah, what about well, that? Well, that's the other you thing, too, is that Wade is almost expelled from school because he's been missing so much. He was hitching rides with H, uh, primarily, uh, to get off planet and try to boost his XP. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is, is that he wouldn't ask for a ride back. So what Wade ended up doing was if he didn't earn enough credits by killing kobolds or, you know, lower level enemies, uh, he'd be stranded until he earned that currency to get back. The thing is, is that none of that is an excuse in Oasis Public Schools. Right. So Wade's kind of teetering on the brink of being expelled from school. He knows he can't miss any more school. Um, so pretty high stakes for him at this point in the book. Right. I I guess I just question... I mean, that's the reason why he doesn't he doesn't go out as much as he used to, because one more right. and he's expelled. But I guess I question what happens when you just... Even, on, even where you're stranded you don't have the means to get back in a timely manner? Can you spend days there trying to find a way back? You could spend forever there, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. yeah. If you die there, if your avatar dies, where's your spawn point? Is your spawn point on that planet? I would think it would be in Scipio. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think you're right. realistically, you could 
if you get stranded, you could, you know, a lot like uh, in any game where you get stuck uh, in the in the actual <laughs> map, and you're suicide? like, well, here's a grenade. <laughs> I guess I gotta die. <laughs> Just toss right. it on the ground, but you'd have to start completely from scratch again. Like it's it's got new character generation. It's your last resort to kill yourself because you try every so way to get, get out, class. but you can't. Um, yeah, is that is that you lose everything. is that the way out of being stranded? I, I think that could be a choice, but I don't think it would be the choice because you lose everything. You start from scratch; it's game over, and and then you start back in Incipient. Now, chance it's still your same character when you go to school. Mm. It's not like Wade Four now, <clears throat> but it, it, that would just so be you lose, because you've lost everything. Lose the sword, money, and the, everything, the armor, and the shield. Well, when you put it that way, you're not losing a whole lot. <laughs> well, he's level three. Uh, but which yeah, took I, him I think a while. it's interesting that, that that this is another example of in-game class separation. That you can't go anywhere if you don't have enough money to get there. You can't make enough money to go anywhere if you can't actually get off of the school grounds or Incipia. Which, by the way, you can't make him any money doing anything on those pla- in those places anyhow. It's just uh, that that not having money limits your ability to make money in the Oasis. Mm-hmm. You know, and and going and making a stupid mistake is making a stupid mistake out in space. Okay, that's fine, but you have to have enough money to have a ship to actually go to a place where you could make a stupid mistake. So I'd imagine that if you've got the ship to go and make that kind of stupid mistake, you probably have some credits to get back or fix it. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's ultimately, you know, crazy stupid mistake, but... It's just an example of how there's this there's this reinforcement of of a class level even in the oasis that it's very difficult to get out of poverty uh, in the oasis without spending money. So if you're poor in the real world, you're poor in the oasis, and you can't go anywhere, kid. Sorry, get learned yeah, up. Right. Um. <clears throat> so Wade is stuck on Ludus given all of those facts. And he, he makes a great line. I really, for some reason, this is one of the lines that stuck with me. And, I, you know, props to Ernest Klein for writing it. <laughs> is I felt like a kid standing in the world's greatest video arcade without any quarters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh. It's like, I think we've all been that kid. If you ever been to an arcade and, you know, you got shortchanged by your mom or for whatever reason... You just ran out of money. This even ties back into the very beginning when we were talking about being at the uh, the casino, John. You got the yeah. pocket full of money that you're willing to spend. Sometimes that goes out before your friends does. <laughs> yeah. Well, my parents were always the ones that didn't realize how much it cost to actually play in an arcade. So they'd give yeah. me like three bucks and say, here yeah. you go. Have fun. I'm like this is this is a half hour's worth of fun. I need more yeah. than this, <laughs> especially if I'm playing like Area 51, where you die constantly and keep pumping in quarters to try to get to the end. <laughs> but to offset that, Wade has tried to. He's at least made the attempt to try and get jobs, um, you know, inside the Oasis, uh, being a system architect or. Uh, you know, he's a builder. He's a builder. He'd basically, go in and help code buildings and shit, which kind of goes to point that somebody had mentioned in Reddit, which was, you know, how do they program, and can the system be hacked? And and my point of view was, well, if you're in the Oasis and you're programming from with, with, within the Oasis, then you can't hack because you're at that higher level of coding. So I think it's really interesting that it's not just that the worlds were there to begin with. People are architecting worlds to accommodate players. Yeah, so it's kind of open source. Yeah. You know, as as people want new worlds to occur in social media and they want to reflect that in the Oasis, they can. If I wanted uh, the Roger Rabbit universe to exist on a planet that, you know, with enough money and resources, I totally could make planet Roger Rabbit. Which, by the way, would be my planet. <laughs> which would be called... I would freaking love <laughs> which that. Which would be called Toontown. Of course, it'd be it would be like it'd be like Toon World, maybe, but but it'd be like that that cross between the the nineteen fifties and <laughs> God, I fucking love that movie. I'm gonna have to watch that yeah, tonight. The, the the cartoons are like a little bit bitter, yeah, but you can still like cross the road Baby and you're Herman. all really sunshine and happy. <laughs> exactly. All right, 
I want my stogie. Well, I'm going to watch Roger Rabbit. And whatever you decide to watch tonight, go ahead and watch it now. We promise we will be back in better time next week. For another episode of Get to the Good Part. In the meantime, please, 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 please go on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever platform you listen to this podcast on and give us a review. It really helps us out. It helps us reach a larger audience. Um, helps us out in a lot of different ways. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at GTTGPPod. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash get to the good part. Uh, you can also find us uh, at our website, gttgp.com, and at our email address, gttgp.pod at gmail.com. Whatever method you choose to get a hold of us, please do. Uh, we really appreciate you guys writing in, giving us feedback, giving us questions, things like that. Um, we're going to try to fit him into the show however we can. Um, it's been a blast this week engaging with you guys on the My Oasis ride. I'm not really sure what we're going to do for Chapter 5, but I'll be on Reddit and on the Twitter and on the Twitter. <laughs> I'll be on Reddit and on Twitter and on Facebook. And pretty soon uh, we'll have a question for the next episode that we can bring up again. Uh, again, everybody, thank you so much uh, for being a part of the show and Thank you for listening. Uh, until next time, I'm Ryan. I'm John. I'm Chris. And we are Get to the Good Part. So long. Okay, so, John, just cut out all of our shit and just keep that. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> That's what I was thinking when I was listening to that. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, well, move all our shit can go away. <laughs> Thank you for presenting that in a way like you're not answering your question. I appreciate that, Chris. That you're winning the podcast right? with John and Ryan. <laughs> we have no idea what the fuck we're talking about. <laughs>